Hi Lana, hello and welcome once again to Lana's Coach. Uh, so in this particular tutorial, we are going to have an understanding of what computer organization and computer architecture is all about. But first, we are going to understand what computer architecture is. So by definition, computer architecture are basic attributes of hardware components and the interconnections. Yeah? that actually work together to achieve certain objectives in terms of their functionality and performance. Uh, if we take a layman's understanding, we can look at computer architecture as your house. Yeah? Normally you bring a designer or rather you bring an architect who is going to design your house and that particular design is going to inform the overall outlook or how your house is going to look like. Yeah. So basically, with that kind of understanding, we must have a computer architecture for us to have a computer system. Yeah. So it's going to bring or uh, inform the structure of a computer system. After having the computer architecture is where now we can have the computer organization in place. So in our respective understanding of what computer architecture, we can always refer to these as attributes of a system that have a direct impacts on stuff such as memory addressing uh, technologies, uh, also the I.O. mechanism, input-output mechanism, the instruction set, uh, the logical execution of programs, as you are going to see at the tail end of this particular uh, tutorial. Now, that is computer architecture. Then we have the other understanding, computer organization. So once you have the computer architecture in place, assuming now you have your house that has been designed in place. So you have to now uh, go to each and every room and maybe organize your bedroom, your sitting room, yeah, and your kitchen. Yeah? So that is actually the computer organization. Once you have that particular blueprint of the architecture, now you can always organize the various parts of the computer uh, together. And what is going to uh, inform the kind of arrangement that you're going to have? It's the design and the physical arrangement of various hardware units that work in tandem. For instance, we can decide to organize some hardware parts in terms of their input or, or in terms of input devices. We can also decide to organize them in form of output de uh, devices and so on. So I believe now you understand how organization comes in. Yeah. So this kind of arrangement is when is, is, is this kind of arrangement is what is actually integrated to the already established computer architecture. So computer organization refers to the operational units and the interconnections, yeah? Like we have the interconnection between input and output, or input and, and processor, uh, output and processor, right? And so on. So uh, from the programmer end, he or she visualizes these particular operation units in terms of the control signals, the interfaces between the computer and the peripherals, peripherals such, such as the output, input devices, and of course, the memory that is being implemented. It could be uh, permanent or temporary uh, memory. So I think now we have a clear understanding of what computer organization is and what computer architecture is. So let's proceed and look at the structure and function. So when we talk about the organization or rather the computer architecture, we have the structure of the computer. And remember we said that computer architecture basically gives us the what? The structure. So the structure is the way in which components relate to uh, each other, right? Like we have input devices that are normally made to send signals yeah, to the processor or to the computer. And of course we have output uh, devices that receive signals. We also have the function. Now the function is the operation of indivi individual components as part of the structure. Yeah? So we can have functionality of a mouse, functionality of the CPU, and so on. So all computer functions are re either data processing or performs data processing role. They either control the signals or the instructions. They help in data movement. Of course, they also perform the data storage functionality. Yeah? So in terms of data processing, a computer must be able to process data which may take a wide variety of forms and the range of processing, uh, which we are going to look at how 
the computer processor functions. Of course, we have data storage, which can be either permanently, as I mentioned, or temporary. Talking about ROM and RAM. We also have the management of data movement. Yeah? So computer must be able to uh, move data between itself and the outside world. That is the essence of input-output. Then, between the input-output, we need to have some control mechanism. So all the above must need, this, uh, the, uh, need some kind of control uh, mechanism. So that is, what, that is the meat that we add to the computer architecture and organization, the structure and function. So uh, when we dive deep into understanding the organization of computers, we can categorically say that computers are made of five components, right? We have the input devices, we have the CPU, we also have the output devices, we have the primary memory, and the secondary uh, memory. So as you can see in this particular diagram, we have these particular arrows that shows how the data moves back and forth. Like for example, when we process data, the, the central processing unit has the capability of storing the instructions within the main memory or the primary memory and of course fetching the instruction. That's why we have two arrows pointing at the primary memory and uh, going and back to the central processing unit. Same thing, we have data movements between the CPU and also the, uh, the external storage or what we refer to as uh, the secondary memory. For instance, the hard disk. Also, we have the back and forth. This means that the C CPU can be able to fetch or retrieve some kind of saved information from the storage device and also save that particular information. And of course, we have the input output, which are going to see what they are. Of course, central processing unit, it has to process some data. Where does it get this particular data? It has to get the data from the input devices. That's what we say, that's why we say input devices perform the function of sending instructions to the CPU as that particular arrow indicates. And of course, the output devices retrieve or rather receive instructions from the CPU. So you can see the arrow pointing the output uh, to the output device. That means it is receiving instructions from the CPU. So majorly those are the main components of the computer. So in a nutshell, we have the input inputting, where we have uh, the raw data being sent to the uh, computer. Of course, we have storage. We have also mentioned the processing aspect. We also have the outputting, yeah, receiving of these particular signals and then uh, maybe displaying them. So we can have in, uh, output devices such as printer, speakers, and so on. The main other operation is the control aspect. You're going to see how the computer, mem uh, the computer CPU performs the control mechanism of the incoming signals from the input devices and ensuring that they are processed in a given manner, right? So uh, before maybe we understand how the CPU functions, it's very important <coughs> to understand the difference between input and the output and of course the IO devices that we have. Now, one main role, when you talk about the computer organization, we have the data movement. And this data movement is what is going to transform the data uh, from how, from the raw aspect to some kind of information that make sense. So we have one major role of input devices, which is to send, right? So input devices send signals yeah, to other parts of the computer, more so the CPU. That's why we normally say that there's no, any, there's not, no other part of the computer that is able to send data. It's only the input devices. So I think now we understand the role of the input devices. It helps in giving instructions or a data to the processor to process it. And of course, we have the examples. I believe we know uh, we have we know the different categories of input devices. One uh, notable op option is the scanner. I mean, the keyboard and the mouse that we normally use frequently. So we can see that input only flows in one direction. If you recall this particular 
um, this particular diagram. You can see it only flows in one direction. Of course, you have output device. As I mentioned, this one performs the work of receiving data from other parts of the computer, more so the CPU after it has processed that particular data. So good example are, as mentioned, the speakers, the projectors. Remember also this one also uh, receive data just from one direction, right? Now we have some parts of the computer or other input and output devices that has the capability of sending and receiving the signals from the CPU at the same time. Yeah, so they are very unique. Yeah, in that they can always send data and at the same time receive data from other devices. Examples are like the touch screen, like your smartphone. That's a good example. You also have the fax mic. We have the headphones, yeah, that has the capability, of, uh, the headset that have the speakers and the microphone, right? So these are just some composition of the computer organization, right? So we can organize computer components into input devices, into output devices, and of course into storage devices that we are likely to uh, see. Now, when you talk about computer architecture, one way of actually describing the computer architecture is via the motherboard, right? Uh, we normally refer to it as the main board. Sometimes we can call it the system board. So it gives uh, room for us to understand how the computer architecture is actually implemented, right? As you can see the diagram there, it's like a house that has some kind of compartments or rather rooms. So from here we can now organize yeah, now we can organize the various parts of the uh, computer into input, output, and so on. Yeah. So it has the capability of holding the processor, uh, the memory, the expansion slots, right? So it's a very, very important part of the computer architecture, right? So once we have this particular uh, computer architecture, we can now then organize the various parts as uh, shown. So we can have the CPU. Uh, the CPU is actually integrated within the motherboard. You also have the main memory. So these are just some uh, vital components of the computer that are integrated within uh, the motherboard. We can also have the complementary uh, semi-oxide yeah, uh, memory. Also we have what is referred to as the CMOS battery. You also have level 2 cache RAM. Yeah, I think I'll mention some of these particular components as we proceed. But talking about computer organization, we must be able to understand how the CPU functions and of course how the main memory functions. Remember also we have the basic input output system that allows us to have some sort of ROM. Now, when you talk about processing of data, we have a vital a component known as the processor. Uh, some people refer to it as the central processing unit or the CPU. Yeah. Now this is a game changer when it comes to processing. Yeah. Because we normally refer to it as the brain of the computer. It has the capability of transforming raw data into some kind of useful uh, information. So, what makes this particular CPU such uh, an effective uh, component? or rather the brain of the computer. It has some um, main operational units, like the registers, arithmetic, logic, control, and of course, cache memory. So central processing unit, as we said, we can organize the various parts of the uh, CPU that to ensure that those, uh, those units work in tandem to achieve a particular objective right in terms of functionality and performance so as you can see these particular parts or compartments of the cpu are grouped together like we have the arithmetic unit which has the capability of ensuring that the cpu can be able to add subtract and do those arithmetic operations we also have the logic unit that allows the cpu uh, to be able to compare right like use of uh, operations such as greater than, equal to, and so on. 
And of course, you have the control unit that has the capability of managing the instructions that are coming from the input and before releasing them to the output. And of course, you have the cache memory. Now, cache memory is a very vital memory that the CPU uses to fetch frequently accessed instruction. So rather than going back to the main memory, the CPU normally accesses those particular instructions from the uh, cache memory. So in a nutshell, we also have the registers, right? These are very special purpose and temporary storage units that are very, very powerful and they, they actually send and receive uh, data at a very high uh, speed, right? We also have main memory, as I mentioned. A good example of main memory is the RAM. RAM, we commonly refer to it as the working area of the computer or the volatile. Yeah? When the power goes, we also lose the information that is stored within the, what? Uh, the RAM. We also have the arithmetic unit, as I've mentioned. The operations can, it, it performs operations such as addition, subtraction, uh, multiplications, and division. So these are very crucial uh, component of the CPU. And of course, we have the logic unit. As I mentioned, this one allows the computer or rather the CPU to compare, yeah, uh, such as we can have comparisons such as greater than, less than, equal to. And of course, we have the control unit uh, uh, that maintains the sequence of operations within the CPU itself. Cache memory, I've already uh, mentioned, it performs some kind of, it gives room for the CPU to fetch uh, frequently accessed uh, instructions uh, or frequently accessed instructions be, instead of going all the way to the main uh, memory. Now, when understanding or if you want to understand how the CPU works, we need to understand the four main operations. We normally refer to it as the fetch execute cycle. Now, these four main operations actually summarizes the functionality of the CPU. We have the fetch instruction, we have the decode of the instruction, we also have the execution of the instruction. And lastly, we can display these instructions or we can store them in the memory. So let's look at these main operations. So before we understand how these kind of operations happen, it's important to understand how the various components or the various units communicate. For the CPU to be able to achieve its functionality and performance, we have what we refer to as internal components communication. This communication are divided into two major categories. We have communication from the processor to the memory. Communication from the memory, I mean from the processor to the various uh, input and output devices. So that's the first communication that we need to understand. Processor to memory, processor to I.O. devices. We also have the other set of communication that happens between the memories and the processor. Now, this is a bit uh, technical, but we're just going to highlight briefly because we're talking about the computer organization and how the CPU functions. Now, when you have the processor to memory communication, the processor has to fetch instructions from the memory. So it needs to communicate to the memory. Now, in achieving this, the processor needs to allocate some memory units where it's going to uh, put these particular instructions, right? Now, this particular memory units is what we refer to as the memory address register. It's like labeling the various instructions and knowing which instruction to fetch next and which one uh, maybe to uh, not to fetch. Yeah. Now, when we pile, when the processor piles this instruction in some given manner, we refer to that as memory buffer register. Yeah. Knowing which one to process first, knowing which one to process next. Now, all these operations are commonly referred to as the memory read, where the processor reads that particular instruction, and when it executes that particular instruction, it now we now refer to that as memory write operation. We also have another communication. Now this is the third communication that happens within the processor. It is referred to as the processor to I/O device communication. 
Now this communication happens between the various uh, info, uh, I mean the, the various input and output devices to the processor. Now that particular interface where the processor interacts with the input devices, we normally refer to it as the interface unit, right? So between the processor and the I/O devices, we have the CU, the cent, uh, the control unit, which actually manages this particular uh, communication. It forms some kind of uh, intermediary, yeah, between the processor and this particular uh, devices. So, having understood the various communications within the processor, I think now we need to understand how this particular processing happens. Now, we have different stages of processing or cycles for that matter. But before we look at the main cycle, that is the instruction cycle, we have the machine cycle. We all know that before a computer processes any given data, it has to understand it. Now, that means it has to convert that particular data to some kind of understandable language. This understandable language that the computer understands is also referred to as machine language. So it transfers them into ones and zeros yeah, before it actually starts the processing. So that's the first cycle. The, the main cycle is actually the instruction cycle. Here is where the fetching happens. Remember the processor and the memory communication. So it has to fetch or retrieve instructions from the main memory right, before it actually uh, processes them. Now, after the fetching has happened within the instruction cycle, the decoding happens. Now, the CPU or the processor can only process data that it understands. That's what's referred to as decoding. It needs to break down the instructions that has been fetched from the main memory so that it can understand it. After it has understood by, uh, through decoding of this particular instruction, it goes to the next cycle the execution cycle. Now the execution cycle is where it executes those particular instructions that are decoded. Yeah. And then after it has executed them, it has the option of either displaying this particular information, right, or storing. Yeah. So these are the main cycle that the CPU goes through. Remember we have talked about the machine cycle. We have looked at the instructional cycle, and of course, you have looked at the execution cycle. So, should someone maybe ask you how the CPU performs or operates? Uh, that's exactly what happens. Now, the communication between the various components within the processor cannot just happen without mentioning the bus. Now, the bus is a set of wires yeah, that helps move data from one part of the CPU or computer to the next. The bus can be looked at as a road yeah, where different vehicles go through. So the wider the bus, the more data can be transferred from one part of the computer to the other. So when you look at the road, if you have a wider road, like a super highway, that means we can have a lot of vehicles going back uh, to and fro at the same time. So that means the bus also has the capability of transferring a large amount of data if it has a wider bus. So data bus here can be of, the, uh, we can have different systems like the 32-bit address or the 64-bit data bus. I think we also have the 128. So the wider the bus, the more data can be transferred. That's why sometimes you realize that the, some computers are faster than the others because they can be able to transfer a lot of data through the bus. To be able to understand which data is being transmitted or transferred within the bus, we need to have some kind of addresses yeah, to un understand the kind of uh, data that is being uh, transferred within this particular bus. So buses are very, very important. If you look at the architecture of the computer, you realize that there are same, some set of wires that are inbuilt. Those ones are very, very crucial, especially within the motherboard. Yeah, that's why we call it the circuit board. Yeah, it has some set of wires, and these wires is what we refer to as uh, the bus. So there's this diagram that shows actually the back and forth. You can see there's 
how the CPU actually is actually uh, is arranged or actually interacts with the various uh, parts of the computer. Like you can see, within the CPU we have the registers as we have mentioned. We have the CU, uh, we have the LU, we have the arithmetic logic unit. So these are very nice diagram that actually shows how the various components within the CPU interact. But the best one is this one. You can see there's some data movement uh, labeled in red or captured in red and then we have the dotted uh, ones. Now the dotted one shows the control mechanism of the CPU. Now this is the architecture. Also shows the organization of the various parts of the computer. At the center we have the main CPU comprising of the cache memory. Remember we say that cache memory provides an environment where the CPU can easily or free, uh, access frequently accessed uh, instructions instead of going all the way to the main memory. Of course we also have the arithmetic logic unit and the control unit. On the other side we have the I.O. input output devices. Now if you are keen you can see that the instructions from the input output devices are controlled at the CU before they are actually stored within the main memory or rather the, the, the external memory, what we refer to as auxiliary storage, right? So there's a back and forth of this particular communication component within the CPU and actually this diagram shows uh, uh, most of the communication how it's done. Yeah? So we have the processor to memory communication being handled there. We also have the processor to the CPU, uh, to the I.O. communication and so on. So in a nutshell, this is how a CPU uh, actually operates. And you can see the back and forth there, how the data is actually transmitted from one uh, part of the CPU uh, to the other. So when we talk about main memory, or rather memory, we have different categories of memories. The primary memory, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, this is the working memory, known as the RAM. We also have the secondary memory, yeah, that can be used to store results, yeah. We also have internal process memory that is placed inside. This one can be referred to as the cache memory. So memories are uh, memories has different representation. Yeah, we can represent the memory in terms of bits, bytes, and so on. So what you need to know is that the smallest unit is actually the bit. When you have eight bits, then we can talk about a byte, right? And from a byte, now we can go to kilobytes, and you can see how the representation actually happens. So one kilobyte actually makes uh, one thousand bytes actually make one kilobyte, and remember eight bits make one byte. So this memory representation is very very crucial, and this is what informs the capacity or the storage capacity of a given a uh, storage uh, device. Of course, when we proceed, we can have uh, one million bytes uh, making one megabytes and so on. So we can go on and on until we have the terabytes. When we talk about main memory, I've said we can refer to it as RAM. RAM is volatile in that it can you can easily lose your data when the power is uh, switched off, right? We have different categories of RAM. We have the static RAM and dynamic RAM. Static RAM actually uh, doesn't store information when data when power is switched off dynamic ram has some sort of capacitors that can uh, retain yeah some data even if the power uh, goes so you can see here yeah, uh, like the static ram is stored till the power is switched on right is uh, and of course we have the dynamic ram yeah that needs to be continuously refreshed with the power because the capacitor has a tendency to get discharged. So these are the two examples of the ROM. And of course we have the ROM. Uh, ROM refers to read-only memory. This one stores data permanently. Yeah? So you don't need to worry even if your uh, power is switched off. Yeah? So we also have different categories of uh, ROM. 
yeah we have program with read only memory we also have erasable now these are just mechanism of how we can destroy or rather write on this read only memory so we also have the flash rom that is normally used within our uh, cameras digital cameras and so on so these are the different categories of uh, rom so in a nutshell we have looked in depth on how the computer components are organized and of course how the computer architecture is structured so that is how the computer organization and computer architecture uh, actually is implemented we need to know how the various parts of the computer communicate the functionality of the various units of that particular uh, computer so ladies and gentlemen should you find this particular information useful always uh, subscribe and always also feel free to comment in the comment section so that we share our thoughts in regards to the computer memory i mean computer architecture and also the computer organization all right thanks